You believe we're, we're going into recession. It's inevitable, right? I mean, well, in the U.S. it is. Yeah. Uh, I would say in the U.K. it is as well. Everybody's kind of on the uh, backside of the U.S., right? So, um, yeah. I mean, if you look at all the indicators and, and what uh, all the, the, uh, the things that I look at, which are like yield, the, the yield curves, and they've been inverted for a while now. And it's a, it's a, it's a pretty solid indicator. Uh, it's pretty much 100% if indicator if you're looking at the three month and the two year treasury, and uh, and and what those things are doing. But for your listeners and trying to understand exactly how that works is, so if you look at the yield curve, right, and uh, you plot out all the yields of of the treasuries, you you know anything from Fed funds, uh, the the overnight one month, the six month, one year, two year, five year, ten year, fifteen year, twenty or 30 year. So if you if you plot those out in a normal yield curve, you'd see the rates at the front end of the curve lower than the rates at the far end of the curve, right? So longer duration uh, assets should be at a higher interest rate. Because it's more risky. It's more risk. You're, you're risking for a longer period of time, right? So in a normal environment, in a, in a solid, healthy economy, your yield curve should move up from the the shortest duration to the longest duration right yeah but in our yield curve currently our fed funds is up around five percent and you've got the yields that are they're, they're decreasing as you go further out on the yield curve and so what does that tell you that tells you that people believe that yields are going to be lower in the future that interest rates are going to be lower in the future and the reason they're telling you that is because they think that the, the economy is going to contract and when that happens you have your yield your 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 yields that you're looking at right um so you look at the three month the two year and the 10 year are typically the the three yields you're looking at and you plot the three month or the two year against the 10 year 10 years kind of like your your bogey treasury it's your it's your uh, benchmark right so when you look at the three month and you plot it against the two year it's deeply negative and, it, and it's been like that since uh last july i believe and so um and if you look at the two year and you plot it against the the 10 month it's it's about 60 basis points negative versus the three month which is about one and a half percent negative and so it's pretty deep it's a pretty and, and that, that's about as as deeply negative as, as it's been since 2008 and so it's a strong indicator now it doesn't mean that you that you're going into recession like right then it it, it typically goes negative it, it flips negative about a somewhere between six and 18 months, maybe two years before we actually hit a recession. So it's, it, it, it kind of uh, signals that that's the direction we're going in, right? So, but why does it, it so, but it, it not only shows that we're going into recession, it kind of causes it, right? So, and I, and I wrote a whole piece about this, and Danny, I think you read it, um, about yield curves in, in my newsletter months ago. And it, it not only, it the yields, the, the economy is not only affected, it's affected by the yield curves being negative. Because if you, if you know how banks work, they typically lend at the shorter, uh, at the, uh, they, they usually lend at the longer end and borrow at the shorter end. So if those are inverted, then they are not able to make as much money and the, the, the credit kind of contracts. Okay. All right, so as credit contracts and, and liquidity dries up, they're not lending as much. That's when you know you see it's more difficult to have access to capital. If corporations have and companies have less access to capital, then it's more expensive for them. Their margins compress, their profits decrease, and they have to wind up either um, stopping certain businesses or laying off people, and it just heads us right into recession. It's, it's just a, it's a really strong and uh, and pr it's it's a. Uh, it's a very um, reliable indicator when you look at yield curves. Right. Okay. So, so should we be referring to it as a banana? We're going to banana. <laughs> Danny told me this. Tell the story of Afrikaans because this is brilliant. This blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. So back in back in the seventies, there was an economist who was at Cornell, and uh, and he when he taught his class, he 
and I think Greg Foss actually had him as a professor because he reached really? out to me after I wrote this. He was like, yeah, I had him as a professor. So, uh, but he said, you know, he, what, Al, Alfred Kahn, he, um, he was, he liked to speak very simply and so he could communicate to his students well. And so, but he was hired by the Carter administration to be what they termed the inflation czar, right? And so, um, and if I, I forget what his title was, but um, it was, God, what was it? Uh, it was, and I'll look it up here so we, so we have it. Uh, it was the, uh, he's a, the chairman of the, um, the Council of Wage and Price Stability, right? So he was in charge of, of tackling inflation. And this is in the 70s when inflation was raging out of control. And he kept, he kept telling uh, Carter and, his, and you know, his, his cabinet and speaking to the press, he was talking about how we're in a recession, we're, we're like nearing a depression. And he kept getting in trouble for that and, and like getting called out onto the carpet. And, you know, and, uh, and so he finally just got fed up and he started, he said, fine, well, I won't call it a recession. I'll call it a banana. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he literally, he was quoted, he was quoted in, in the uh, Washington Post. And he said that, you know, we've had the deepest banana we've had in 35 years and inflation hasn't, hasn't really come in yet. And so oh it, it pissed them off royally. What does so. that happen to, to inflation during the recession? Well, you know, uh, inflation ceases. You can have, you can actually have deflation, okay. depending on how bad the, the recession is. But, you know, um, is that the potential deflationary moment that we discussed the other night? At the no, I, I mean that's know. that's a little different. Um, it, so what what Jeff Booth talks about is how technology and and this is a really strong concept. It's a really important concept. Technology creates um, deflation. It's mm -hmm. deflationary, right? Because it, it, if you think about it, in the examples he gives, is like you used to have, you used to go and buy a camera. Well, most people don't even buy cameras anymore. The, the iPhone, these these cameras are incredible, right? So where, how do you paying for that? Well, you're you're not seeing that anymore. It's embedded a little bit in the price of the iPhone, but then talk about calculators, right? So you used to physically, I had calculators yeah. and, you know, an HP 12C that I used um, every single day at work. Now it's, uh, it's the regular calculator is just embedded in this phone and you're not paying for that. It's just gone. Like you, you're not, you're not creating the components. You're not assembling the components. You're not, you know, think of all the supply chain and all the distribution chain that's just completely eliminated from nobody creating, manufacturing buying and selling calculators anymore so that's deflationary it, it's it's nowhere in gdp anymore it's just in your it's in your phone so that's deflationary so technology creates deflationary pressures the problem is that's bad for our our treasuries right because we operate at such a deficit and we've talked about this before our deficit is so high that we have to keep borrowing to pay that that hole that we're creating every single year we have to close that gap and we close it by selling more treasuries and then using that capital to pay off those those maturing treasuries right so the problem is that deficit is growing and our and our our debt is growing and so we need inflation in order to tame that you know keep it from getting out of control why because well the higher inflation you have it's more GDP in nominal dollars, right? Without inflation. And so when you have higher GDP, then your tax base is bigger and you get to tax those dollars and pay down that debt that you've created, that you, that, that you have put on your balance sheet, right? So they need to keep creating higher and higher GDP. You know, it's, it's manipulating higher, like more and more GDP in nominal dollars by, creating inflation, manipulating interest rates to create inflation. And so that's what we're doing. And the problem is though, technology is naturally deflationary. So they have to just print more and more money and manipulate the, the, uh, the, the whole monetary system more in order to manufacture this inflation. It's bad for you and me, 
it's good for the treasury. So really, I mean, I think I think I'm starting to come to an understanding that treasuries and the balancing of inflation is really a way of just stealing from us constantly. Yes, it's a it's a form of uh, silent tax. Yeah, yeah, and and it and it hits certain people worse than hits others. But they get to control the entire market, the interest rates. I know central banks are meant to be and independent. central banks. Yeah, it's it's all it's QE. It's yeah. it's all of it. it. It's all rolled into this manipulation of money. But if you got rid of central banks and bonds, <laughs> would we even care about GDP? I mean, you want your economy thriving. It just shows that you've got a healthy economy. You've got a healthy, uh, you know, uh, community. So whether it's a, an island or a country um, and you want expansion, people are naturally productive. You know, if you sit around all day on the sofa for a week or two, you, you, you're going to feel terrible. Mm. You're going to feel terrible physically. You're going to feel terrible mentally. Like people like to be productive. They like to be interactive and, and uh, produce things. So, um, but the problem is when you force people to be so productive uh, that they have no free time, they have no downtime, they have nothing that that they have just for themselves. And I'm not talking about sitting and watching Netflix because if you're if you're out and working for 12, 14, 15 hours a day, you don't have energy to go and do something physically rewarding for yourself to go climbing or go running or to, you know you just don't have that you don't have that energy and you probably don't have the time if you want to spend some time with your kids or you want to have, you know, you want to sleep. So the problem is we've gotten into a situation where people have two, three jobs, households have three, four, five jobs. I mean, it's, it's out of control and they're just trying yep. to keep up with this inflation. Yeah, this was what Dominic Frisbee spoke about in this last film I made on inflation. Mm -hmm. He referred to it, I think it's the biggest crime of our times or the biggest scam of our times. Cause he, he said, we used to have households that would live on one income. Yeah. Back in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, and yeah. when I was a kid, my, my mom had to start working because we just couldn't keep up, and which is a crime because my dad was a nuclear engineer, you know, but he just wasn't making enough money to support all three kids and get us in schools and pay for college and all. It just wasn't possible. But we've now got households with two incomes or maybe three it's incomes that can't keep up. And they can't keep up. They so I you know, just read something the other day and you know, you have to take some of this stuff with a grain of salt, but there was a study and, um, and, and some sort of survey that said that people have started skipping meals yep. in order to make mortgage payments or make rent payments. Yep. That's a problem. That's an indicator of what we're talking about. They've pushed people the scam doing, too far. Yeah. Man, your dad was a nuclear engineer, a, a nuclear power engineer. Yeah, yeah so he uh, designed steam turbines, ah. uh, steam turbines for uh, for nuclear reactors, and they were in submarines. So his he worked for GE, Navy Nuclear uh, Division, and uh, and so they their client, their only client, was the Navy. So uh, he, what would he make of all these plants being decommissioned in Germany? No, he would He'd be, be like, disgusted. Fucking he would be disgusted. This is just insane. I mean, it's it's literal insanity. Yeah. I mean, they were perfectly productive, and they're closing them down. And people don't understand. We don't have to get into nuclear no, uh, discussion because, but. <laughs> but it's uh, it's it, it's a um, it's going to be looked at. You know, they're going to look back at that as being one of the largest mistakes they've ever made yep. on energy policy in the history of Europe. Right. Back to recessions. Yeah. Um, are recessions healthy themselves, though? Should an economy have recessions? If we're going to have expansion of the economy, do we not need to have recessions? And is it not good to have a period where you know, we can wipe out some businesses, wipe out some jobs, the ones that aren't really? Because I always think the strong businesses will survive. Well, I mean, think about it. So why are, why are weak businesses surviving? Well, they survive and they, they, they thrive, even though they're weak businesses, because we've had ZERP, zero interest rate policy for so long. Mm. And it's just this free capital. And you know, access to free capital allows bad actors and, and poor management, poor risk management to, to actually live and that's, or, or keep going. And that's the problem. So uh, in a normal economy, sure, you're gonna have ebbs and flows. I mean, it, it's, it's organic, right? But in a normal community. But when you manipulate this much, you, those those ebbs and flows turn into peaks and valleys, and they just get larger and larger. And so you think we might be heading for quite a deep recession? Um, well, it's hard to say. I mean, but potentially. So when you, I mean, the problem is we just don't know how we we haven't seen the effects of all these rate rises. Why? Because we've 
we've ra raised the rates so quickly, so rapidly. And I mean, I've got, I don't know if you can pull it up, but that uh, I've got one uh, chart that I, that I showed Danny earlier today that is the uh, just the rate of the rate rises in that the Fed has done. Yeah, I mean, like... What's the time scale on that? Uh, look at that. It's just the middle of, it's just the middle of last year. We just started raising rates. Look at how quickly we've raised those. And so the problem is we haven't had time. Look at back in, uh, even in 2016, look at how, look at how we started raising rates and it's just a stair step and that's kind of normal, you know? Right. Okay. And so, <clears throat> so, and so you start seeing some of the effects of the, of, so if you look at that in, in 2016, you could start seeing those, uh, the effects of those raises in 2018, 2019, 2020, right? But look at how long it took for for those to come into effect where we started decreasing rates. This is before the pandemic. And, you know, you started seeing those. Look at how long it took. But we, I mean, we are just raising these things. It's a rocket ship, you know? I mean, that's it's not healthy. And, and so, so when you look at 2004, that's what really triggered the uh, global financial crisis because the mm -hmm. rates went up. People couldn't afford their mortgages. People who had 100%, 120% mortgages I was yeah. reading about, multiple homes. Yeah. They were trying to flip them. Yeah. And I guess that's... I mean, some of that some of that was just poor poor policy around the mortgage market. You yeah. Know? And so but could, most of that. But do you think we could be ha heading to a... Like, could this have a housing crisis <clears> wrapped <throat> in it again? I don't think it'll be like that. No, okay. because it's not centered around housing. Right. Okay. The problem with this is all that leverage is, is embedded in, in what we're seeing in the banks and we're, we're seeing in, in now, I mean, the commercial real estate market now that that's, it's different than housing. I mean, that's, that's embedded in these small banks. The small banks own all this paper. And so that could be a problem. That could be a major problem. But, you know, what we're not seeing is, is the effects of all those rate raises on all these companies that are now, they're having to refinance notes. They're going to have to, you know, try to, to try to borrow capital. They're trying to get uh, lines of credit and the lines of credit are way more expensive. Now you're seeing individual balance sheets, um, individual credit card um, holdings and, and the balances are, are just skyrocketing and the rates are up over 20% average. That stuff is going to start. Those, those, those uh, birds are, are going to come home to roost, and that's the problem. And we haven't seen that yet. So my 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 fear, mm -hmm. and this is so. I, look, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know, Peter. But I what I I feel I, there's a high probability, and I think of everything in, in probabilities and likelihood, mm -hmm. and and I think there's a high likelihood that we hit a, a pretty you know healthy recession here, and for the reasons that we've talked about, all the leverage. The low interest rates skyrocketing higher, and then you know the inflation, people getting squeezed. It it, it could be it could be a powerful drawdown. So mm -hmm. we could just see a watershed moment, and that could come in the form of a credit event. And I'm talking about one that isn't saved by the Fed and the Treasury. One that we don't have the you know this new little BTFP program that comes in and saves and 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 you know shores up the banks and then we're okay and we can move along and that's just a plug in the hole of this big wall that could that could break that dam could break and i don't know what that could be or what that will be but there's a there's a high um chance of that there's much higher than non-zero chance of them there being a credit event 